This afternoon, we have the opportunity uh, to spend some time with Dr. Richard Sturba. And over this period of time, we hope to get something of the you know, personal man, this man who so many know as a scientist, as a teacher, as a man who worked with Freud in Vienna, and who, without any question, uh, is the person, along with his wife, who brought psychoanalysis really into uh, full bloom in, in this area, and has contributed so widely in so many areas. We know that the the time we can spend a day uh, in no way uh, is enough to to uh, accomplish what what we're after but at the same time uh, uh, the efforts going to be made now dr. Sturba uh, without getting into an introduction because the whole time we spend together is is just that I don't know just how you would prefer to begin to cover this amazing career in life. Uh, it doesn't seem to be so amazing to me. <laughs> you know? When I look back, I came into analysis because I was interested in psychology already as an, uh, in the gymnasium, but I had ne never had heard of Freud. Freud wasn't mentioned in our studies. It was only at the university, or rather during my military service, uh, which was right after the gymnasium in the first world, during the First World War, I came in contact with a group of intellectuals in the officer school who were older men, and there was one was an actor and one was a very well-known uh, playwright and author and one was a composer, and they talked about the new ideas of Freud. Hmm. And uh, it fascinated me, and I began to read it. And uh, during my medical uh, uh, studies, I attended lectures by Paul Schilder. Paul Schilder, who was an analyst, and uh, taught at the uh, uh, psychiatric Institute uh, under the auspices of Wagner Jorek, the famous mm. uh, uh, discoverer of malaria therapy, who was against analysis in general, but was rather tolerant and uh, had approximately the same age as, Fro as Freud. And they were colleagues mm. in some way, but at a certain distance. And Schilder presented cases and explain them psychodynamically. And uh, this, of course, gave us a stimulus to read about psychoanalysis. And I got very fascinated by Freud's writings, by, mainly by his style, by the clarity of his expressions, by the wonderful beauty of his uh, uh, diction. And uh, then I decided I would like to know more about it. And just at that time, the Psychoanalytic Institute in Vienna was founded. Uh, it was the second institute in the world after the Berlin Institute, which was founded by Eitinger. And the director was Hitchman, and I went to Hitchman, and he took me to personal analysis. And I was one of the first students. I and Grete Biebring, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe at the end, when we show some of the documents, I will show you a document where Freud signed that I have gone through the... Isn't that interesting? Yeah, which is a unique document, because only Goethe Biebring and I have one. He signed it as, not as the director of the institute, which was Helene Deutsch, but he signed it as the president of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society. and. The other societies objected to that, that we got our certificate 
of graduation signed by Freud. So only two were issued, mm. and I have one of them that hangs over there. And uh, I went through the courses and was uh, very well accepted there and very much favored by Hitchman and by uh, Faden and uh, particularly also by Wilhelm Reich. Wilhelm Reich was one of the most uh, prolific uh, writers at the time, very classical still as an analyst, and had an enormous uh, fascination for our students because it was, he was such a dynamic personality. Mm. And he made me very soon assistant at the Psychoanalytic Ambulatorium, which was, was the Psychoanalytic Clinic. So I started, uh, uh, at the end of my analysis, I started to treat patients for, I got 250 shillings, which was approximately $30 or something, for five cases a month. A month? <laughs> a month. A month. A month. Right. And I had to take, have five cases at cases. the ambulatorium. And uh, I was still then in rotating internship, uh, in uh, rotating residency rather, in one of the Viennese hospitals. And I finished that and uh, took the job at the clinic and this started my psychoanalytic career. Give us a date now to, to uh, uh, when did the institute in Vienna? The institute get... was uh, started in 1923. 23. 1923. And uh, I finished my courses in 1927. I see. Oh, nine, no, it was started in 1924, but I had already yeah. started my personal analysis. Impressional analysis. analysis. And then I gradually went into private practice, and uh, I'm in private practice To this since. day. Now, but I soon yeah. became a teacher at the Institute. Let me uh, ask you, uh, at this particular time, uh, was there a... Uh, this was after the war. The institute started because of the increasing demands for for training. Uh, it was first the institute was started because mainly in competition with the Berlin, or, or let's say after the model of the Berlin, the Berlin institute. institute. But it was at the time when it was already recognized that in order to become an analyst you have to have a personal psychoanalysis, which was called a training analysis. And this established a kind of organized teaching. Right. And this is really the, the beginning of a formal designation of formal a training system. analysis. As because originally, Freud, who was a genius and could analyze his own dreams, uh, thought if you analyze your dreams, you can become an analyst. Yeah. He didn't recognize, like so often, how difficult it was for other persons mm -hmm. to analyze their dreams, that you need an analyst to do your self-analysis. He, as, as a giant, uh, in so many respects, was also unique in this respect. But he came to this realization also, that, that one really had to have a more formal analysis. Yeah, because the others couldn't do it. Because they couldn't, like it he did not it. work. Yeah. But the first analyst, had uh, some discussions with him and maybe he analyzed their dreams mm -hmm. but it was on walks and mm -hmm. not not a formal mm -hmm. training analysis mm -hmm. on the couch which was only instituted maybe uh, from 1918 and 1920 on um. that people came to Vienna in order to be analyzed by Freud for the purpose of training right now uh Freud was, of course, continually active in the society. Was he also active in the institute as you knew it? No. Uh, you shouldn't forget that in 1923 he had, he his, had his cancer. cancer. Operation. So he was out. For he didn't attend meetings of the society, except in fall of 1925 he went to the morning session for Abraham, where he didn't speak, Anna Freud read his uh, uh, obituary. 
And uh, then at his 70th birthday in 1926, May 6, 1926, I remember it very well, he uh, accepted our congratulations of the members of the society in his home and of the, the few trainees. There were only five or six. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there we could see with him. But then soon, not quite soon, but in 1928, he started uh, with meetings in his home, private scientific meetings. Okay. And since uh, the meetings took place in the waiting room of his apartment, of his uh, office, uh, it couldn't, uh, not many people couldn't, uh, could uh, attend, attend it. Yeah. So it was uh, approximately 12 to 14 persons. And the board was always invited and then the students were selected by Federn. Now I happened to be a f favorite of Federn's and he invited me more often mm. than I had it coming. So I attended approximately eight or nine of such scientific meetings and, uh, and I had the boldness um, in Jewish on what called the chutzpah, chutzpah. <laughs> to uh, present a paper there, the paper on sublimation, the theory of sublimation or the problem of sublimation, the problems in the theory mm -hmm. of sublimation, to which Freud listened very attentively and mm. spoke afterwards for almost half an hour on uh, sublimation. But I attended approximately eight of the meetings, mm -hmm. altogether only 12, because Freud was sick again and again. again. And the last meeting was 1932. Then I saw him once or twice more. Yeah, I saw him more often when I, I became the libra librarian of the Vienna Psychological Society. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And then uh, Freud went with me to his library and gave us books and so mm -hmm. on. So I saw him privately. And uh, once it was very amusing, out of a book fell something, a, the announcement of his office, of the opening of his office in, 19, in 1891. And uh, I, I said, can I have that, Professor? And he said, yes, take it. Uh, so I have it here, and there's only one, one other one. For it's a unique sakes. document. You know, because uh, um, Ernst Freud had another one, which is now in the museum, in, museum. in Marysfield Gardens in London. During this time, who were the, the individuals? You mentioned uh, Federn. Uh, and, and certain others, who were those that, that you found yourself either uh, working with or in close association with or deriving the, uh, the greatest stimulation from within the area of, of psychoanalysis? Obviously, we'd like to get into the other areas of your life as well as, as we go along. Uh, it was originally very much Wilhelm Reich. Mm -hmm. Wilhelm, Wilhelm Reich conducted the technical seminar. In the institute. In the yeah. institute. And he was a brilliant clinician. I never heard anybody summarize a case so brilliantly as he did. Of course, he gradually uh, became, Ill, this, uh, right. uh, became uh, more and more interested in communism and uh, left the society, mm -hmm. went to Berlin and so on. But uh, the greatest stim stimulation I derived from him and uh, uh, when I presented my first case report, Helene Deutsch asked me she would like to uh, control a case of mine mm. because she found the report was so good. So I had uh, maybe ten uh, supervisions with Helene right. Deutsch. I had altogether maybe 25 supervisions. Mm -hmm. And then Helene Deutsch, who was the director of the institute, mm -hmm. said, I think it's time for you to swim alone. Mm -hmm. If you mm -hmm. haven't learned it up till now, you'll never learn, mm -hmm. never learn it. And you shouldn't be told what to do mm -hmm. and what to see. Mm -hmm. You should find out for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think it was very good. They demand now 200 to 250 okay. supervision yeah. hours, and I don't think they make better analysts as they made at that time. Yeah. Uh, more control, not necessarily uh, mm -hmm. higher quality. Higher quality. Right. 
but uh, I had uh, discussions. But I had, I attended my technical knowledge stems from attending uh, seminars, te uh, technical seminars through 12 years. Mm. First conducted by Wilhelm Reich, then by Helene Deutsch, then by Anna Freud, by Nunberg, and uh, Friedon for a while. And I always reported cases, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, I got a tremendous knowledge. Man, If you attend such a seminar, you have always another case of somebody else's mm -hmm. uh, uh, to add to your own clinical material and knowledge. These had then uh, something of the quality that uh, later uh, was emulated in New York with Chris, who... Yeah, it was uh, something. Uh, where it was a... R ongoing graduate kind of, of experience. Yeah. Uh, I tell you, it was of course a very, uh, very small institute. Uh, the first uh, uh, trainees were Greg um, Biebring and I, then Biebring and Isaac Hauer and uh, Welder mm -hmm. to some extent. Mm -hmm. Then Chris came in it somewhat later. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few Eidelberg, mm -hmm. Bergler. Yeah. But it wasn't but where it they was had 20 and 30 in a class or large no, numbers. No, it, it was. The maximum was uh, 10, 12. Then I attended for a while also the children's seminar, which was founded by Anna Freud together with Mrs. Derber and Marianne Kreis. They see. were the first ones. Started started a seminar, a seminar on technique of child analysis. That was approximately 1924-1925. Well, this uh, then leads into a, another area. Where where uh, did uh, Mrs. Sturber and yourself find each other? Uh, how did you come together and and uh, meet and? Uh, I knew some of her relatives and we met, and we were both interested. She was uh, when I. Met her and I was already interested in, in analysis. She was lector at the psychoanalytic publishing house. Hmm. She uh, first had been the private secretary of Otto Rank and uh, then uh, was under Storfer, one of the editors. Mm -hmm. She edited uh, the uh, edition of 1926. Uh, But Freud's birthday is collected works. Right. The came German. Out in a yeah. very beautiful edition. Yeah. And she was the hersteller of this under Stoffer. Stoffer was a marvelous director. Only he spent too much money. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, then uh, when were you married? What, in what year were, were you? We were uh, married in 1926. In 26. 26. I see. And she... Shortly before I graduated. I see. And she at this time was already uh, she was deeply already involved, involved in, deeply in her involved. own analytic, analytic work yeah. and training. She and was so analyzed so by <coughs> Alfred Freiherr von Winterstein, Perhaps a PhD right. who was uh, a, uh, a early pupil of mm -hmm. Freud's. And uh, we attended the seminars together and so mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we established a home and analytic sure. life together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Uh, then during these years, uh, really your analytic career in Vienna would have been from uh, 24, 5, along in there. You took the Til job in, until 38. Til 38. And this obviously had to do with, with the upheaval. Uh, yeah, and when uh, Hitler came in uh, three days later, I left. I was the first analyst to, le to leave Vienna with my family. I see. Because I didn't want to be under the right. Nazis. And you had children. You had your two yeah, children had at this point. Yeah, I had two children, yeah. And uh, fortunately, our Viennese housekeeper came along with us <coughs> from Marie. I yeah. think you knew her. Yes, huh? yeah. And she died in the meantime. She uh, retired to Vienna and died. But uh, it was a uh, great fortune because we could travel and do all kinds of yeah. things. Yeah. We uh, fled to Switzerland and uh, stayed there for almost a year. Till we got there. You lived in Switzerland yeah. for a year before coming to the United yeah. States? Yeah, till we got the visas. I see. Quite some time. 
and uh, first in Basel and then in Ascona, uh, Ascona near Locarno on the Lago Maggiore. And it was just beautiful if it were not the tremendous pressure. Yeah, it would have been a lovely soldier. It would soldier. have been the most marvelous. Fi five patients from Vienna came with me. So that I, had I see. And four of my patients came to Detroit. You from don't Vienna. Mean it. Uh, from, no, it was one, two from Switzerland, uh, one, two from Holland, and from Mrs. Derba, a French girl. I see. They came out and continued their analysis. Just continued to. So uh, when we came here, we had uh, not to ask Beginning practice. Cases. Yeah, we yeah. had already our practice. We brought our practice a lot. Now, how did you happen to choose uh, Detroit? Uh, it was approximately Can I have a 10. Match? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. It was so that Fritz Redl was here, and who was my analyst in Vienna, and uh, Dorsey, whom I knew from Vienna, who had been in analysis with Freud. And uh, there were approximately 10, anal ten uh, persons in Detroit who got their training in Chicago, mm -hmm. 10 psychiatrists, mm -hmm. and had to commute. And when we came, we could establish a sub-institute here, here, and they didn't have, so it was, the field was made yeah, for us, yeah. so to say, and it was the easiest to start, and I don't regret it. Marvelous. Yeah. I'm very glad to be here. Now, this was, in many respects, however, the, uh, while there was apparently a society here at this time, uh, a study and they group. were a study group. A study group. Uh, As, uh, it, it needed ten members, ten uh, full members to, to become a society. a society. And we had to scratch them together, together with Cleveland, there was Finlayson and Ulrich, and uh, one man from Cincinnati, I forgot his I name see. now. So we got the ten together. Pulled together to, to establish yeah. a, a society, society, and then beginning training. Beginning training. Uh, but I was immediately made a training analyst at the, and Mrs. Derber too at the Chicago Institute. I see. Then under that auspices, yeah, it then yeah. became an independent yeah. institute yeah, yeah. fairly shortly thereafter. Fairly shortly. Happel was here. Clara Happel. Clara Happel. Yeah. Right. And um, uh, so we had four uh, training analysts. At that time. With Bartemeyer. Now, uh, to, to uh, how, did, how did your children take the transition? Uh, they were st still quite young at this time. Uh, Monica was uh, four and a half, uh, five, five. Verena was one and a half uh, just years an old, uh, just uh, hardly out mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. diapers. And uh, Monica uh, had in the beginning an awfully hard time. She was very much attached to our little estate and on one of the Austrian lakes hmm. near Salzburg in the Alps, uh, which uh, she uh, was really enthusiastic about. And she reproached us for being unfaithful to our fatherland. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I remember a charming uh, little story when Mrs. Derber left Vienna with her. Monica took a little ladybug uh, along and uh, they forgot it in the hotel in Milan, you know. And Mrs. Devert said, somebody will, uh, and it was unconsolable. Mrs. Devert told her, but somebody will let it fly and then it will be free. And she said, but it can't live there. It's an Austrian lady. <laughs> 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 it must have been hard on her. It, at is that very, point. it was very hard. And I would imagine that the circumstances. Since we uh, wanted to uh, uh, feel that she has roots. Mm -hmm. Somewhere. Mm -hmm. This estate is in the family of uh, Ditas for more than 100 years. Mm -hmm. And she had a feeling that uh, this was really something which, uh, where, she, where she belonged. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that part of the year she lives there again. Oh, is that right? Child, yeah. Well, we'll get, uh, we'll get back to... Uh, now, uh, how much English had you developed uh, as an analyst in, in Vienna. That is, again, one would think immediately of the language. Uh, yeah. I was 30 years old when I studied, when I learned English. It was rather late. 
and uh, I took English lessons and then I took an American patient who didn't pay me but who could uh, uh, talk German and, and, English. and English and she uh, I conducted the analysis in English and where I didn't understand she, she helped me it would help you in the uh, German and then I had two or three finally five American patients mm -hmm. who I talked half the day in, in English, English. in Vienna I see you know. I see so it was relatively easy and at that time I would imagine there were I quite a written, number written you had written in English uh, I began to write in English in Ascona I see a little paper the uh, but papers of mine have been translated all right now uh, let let's also talk something about uh, your writings because this has been such an integral part of your career uh, not only in psychoanalysis but uh, you know in yeah. in areas relative to this in in obviously your interest in music which we'll want yeah. to talk about uh, how did you come by your facility and interest in uh, in writing and uh, where has this I didn't have to take a course in creative writing. <laughs> and I think creative writing cannot be taught, taught. and cannot be learned. And uh, I just wrote. But uh, I had a clear way of thinking. And if you think clearly, you can write, write clearly. clearly. Mm -hmm. If it is not foggy. And I had a rather good, particularly in German, a rather good style. A very good. Uh, uh, just the way of expressing myself. Did you enjoy writing before entering medicine uh, as a as a part only of your a private poetry and so on mm -hmm. and letters? Hmm? I was always a letter writer, and uh, uh, then uh, when I wrote my first scientific papers, they were acclaimed as uh, being well written. Well written. And, that and then uh, there was one. Point. Uh, uh, my first course, my first lecture course at uh, the institute was in 1931 uh, on the libido theory, introduction to the libido theory for the new students. And uh, uh, it was rather well received, and the director of the institute, of the um, publishing house, <coughs> told me uh, he uh, wants to have another uh, copy, bring out quickly another copy of the uh, journal for psychoanalytic pedagogy, psychoanalytic pedagogic. And could I give him the manuscript, and I didn't have any manuscript for my course, in 10 days. So I had nine analytic patients at the time. So I wrote it down in one soup. And this gives the libido theory something very right. compact and right. very, so that it was just recently coming out again and it's still acclaimed as right. a very it's good introduction. standard work, yeah. yeah. It's a standard work now. It was translated in Israel, in, 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 in Hebrew, and in Spanish. So in that your writing has been a, a really from very early, an integral part of, yeah, of yeah. your scientific yeah. work. No. But I have one unfortunate thing. I can only say as much as I know. So my papers are not altogether not altogether unfortunate. Are short and I don't write books. I wrote only the libido theory and I wrote a book with Mrs. Sterba together. On, uh, on Beethoven, Beethoven and his nephew. Right. Which came out now in a paperback. Is yes, there? Yeah. yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, and gets more and more recognition. Mm -hmm. Is uh, apparently w offended many. Uh, oh yeah, no, of course, because it destroyed the hero worship. Yeah, yeah. It didn't take away from the greatness of his music, which people think mm -hmm. it does, mm -hmm. but it uh, doesn't really. It only shows that he's a human being and not, not one of the best mm -hmm. quality. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, your wife shared with you your interest in music, obviously, yeah, as well as your many other interests. She has an, a doctorate interests. in musicology. Right. And uh, when did your career as a musician, not career, but, well, 
in almost a career. Yeah. That was, uh, I started, it was strange how we take our models. When we, in the second grade of grade school, our teacher uh, accompanied our singing lessons with a violin. And I liked it, he was not a great violin player, but I liked it so much that I asked my mother to take violin lessons. And I had violin lessons and from then on started till today. Mm. And I had great teachers, like Adolf Busch and uh, Rudolf Kolisch and Chefchik in Vienna. So I'm a pretty accomplished musician, but I still practice two, three hours a day if I can get to it. I think that uh, those who who know you as a musician uh, would very much have thought this could have been your career. I always think the musicians will think he might be, he's not a very good uh, musician, but he might be a good analyst. The analyst thinks he might be a good <laughs> <laughs> But um, it's so that I cannot play with many dilettantes and mm -hmm. play with professionals, right. string quartets, right. for example. And professionals like like to play with me. Uh, when Serkin, uh, Rudolf Serkin is uh, around here, we always play some. Play together. Something. Now, uh, here again, I think that uh, part of your personal life and your social life and your closest friends must be drawn also from the world of music. The those who well, the share music this or literature, yes, or general cultural interest. My best friend who died a few years ago was a famous publisher, Kurt Wolf. He was the first one who published Kafka and uh, published our Beethoven book also. He was a personal friend of Thomas Mann and of André Gide and so on. And uh, so intellectual centers. And Erich Kahler, who died last year, unfortunately, was professor for cultural history in Princeton. And so historian. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And uh, this, uh, um, just we have uh, a congruence of interests mm. in this respect. The uh, uh, relationship with these people, of course, have not centered around this area. Uh, since uh, so so many that you mention are, are no I uh, really must must say most of my friends live in the east and uh, but I come to the east fortunately mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. often for seven years now I have a monthly seminar a research uh, project going in uh, New York and this gives me the opportunity first to be with top psychoanalysts mm -hmm. no? and discuss problems first of perversion, now of aggression, and uh, uh, then gives me the opportunity to see my daughter who lives yes. in, in the New York area and to hear music. And, uh, and you have summered in the east, uh, in, the, in, yeah. in the northeast, uh, beginning when? I have what? Su summered at Sugar Yeah, Book. yeah, summered. Yeah. I have summered since 1940. Since 40. Since 1940, we go to the east every year. We have a summer home in uh, Vermont, which you know. Yes. And uh, where our friends come and uh, where we have right. the main part of our social life right. there. Right. Which is very comfortable and very easy going and un informal. Now your daughters, uh, one is is uh, in New York. One is uh, in uh, now she lives in Scarsdale. In Scarsdale, she's married to the uh, professor of uh, of psychiatry at uh, Columbia University, yes. and uh, he is uh, director of training at the uh, New York Psychiatric Institute. I see. And uh, also is a relatively young man. We just. Uh, wrote a, together a short biography of Freud for a biographical dictionary which will come out oh, is that right? at Columbia yeah. University. And she's a psychiatric social worker and has two children, a girl and a boy. And the, the older daughter 
is a writer. And is she and she is living in Europe. She is living mainly in Europe. Now she is in Yemen. I see. Mainly I in see. Her husband is a writer also, also. in the book business and just uh, finishes a guide on Turkey. They lived for three years in Turkey mm -hmm. and learned Turkish and uh, enjoyed it tremendously in a fish fishing village in the, uh, the on the Riviera on the Turkish Riviera. Now, how often do you get back to Europe? It must be with a fair degree of regularity. At least once a year. Usually once a year, mm -hmm. or more, or more often year, at yeah. times. And uh, in general, I make it a deductible trip because I invite myself somewhere. I give a paper. Give a paper. Like uh, uh, recently, I give a paper in Hamburg, <coughs> and then one in Jerusalem mm -hmm. on Freud's birthday. May six, I invited me. And. Uh, I, I would I would think that with your your origins uh, there had you been to the United States before? Uh, no, no. Uh, so no, really, no. when you came here to live uh, at the time of the war, was your really your first uh, well, first experience? experience except that I knew a, a, lot, a lot of it from my patients. Exactly, but it hadn't been a, a uh, point where you yeah. vacationed here or come no. before. Um, we were invited in 1929 to come to Boston. But uh, in 1934 again, but uh, Freud, we are discussed it with Anna Freud, and she said her father wants to have the group to stay together right. as long as he is there. Sox came so, before the war, did he? No. Yes, he came before the war. Uh, he, be he came there approximately in 1928. 28, I see. Which would have been one of the enticements to come. I, yeah. I, that there was yeah. a beginning group Helena there. Deutsch came Helena Deutsch before the war. Uh, so that the uh, uh, really the time of the war was not th the main reason for many people coming. There were many who. They came. were already rank had already settled earlier, no? and who else was there? Nunberg was uh, considering it at the time. Uh, at yeah. the time, and uh, again, not with the threat of the upheaval in Europe so much as, as the opportunity. Well, we all feared it. I mean, we all felt that uh, it was around the corner. For some know. time ahead. And Austria. I, I remember when uh, Thomas Mann was there and gave the Freud's 80th birthday in 1936, gave a wonderful paper in Vienna, uh, Freud and the Future. And he went to Freud's house and uh, delivered it to Freud personally, first in a public hall. To us it was a very solemn occasion. It was beautifully spoken. He spoke very beautifully, Thomas mm. Mann. And uh, he liked uh, Vienna rather well. And he asked uh, the uh, chancellor, is it Chancellor? Chancellor. Chancellor, yeah. Chancellor Schuschnigg, whether he should uh, settle. He would mm. have liked it more than in Switzerland, I think. And Schuschnigg said, he cannot advise it. He better doesn't. Mm -hmm. So we knew that it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was too dangerous with this uh, wolf at the door. You know? Could you take anything with you as you left? Uh, the interesting thing is we left uh, within 24 hours, decided, and took only the necessary things, the absolute necessary things, and didn't know what would happen. Left our apartment with a maid there, and uh, we got everything out later. We were not Jewish, so it was not confiscated, you know. We were not political refugees, so it was just an... Uh, uh, a move. A move. We mm -hmm. moved to the United States and they packed everything, uh, even the Communist Manifesto was. <laughs> the only thing was I had a second violin, which mm. I, which didn't arrive. Mm. Did you ever discover why? No. It wasn't too valuable an instrument. It was not a great loss. No. But uh, for the most part, you could then uh, all have all your books, things follow. Yeah. yeah. Oh. All and the books, uh, all the old furniture, no? I see. Which you see out in the hall, you know, which comes from Baroque time mainly.
Now, when when you spoke of Monica and her her attachment uh, to this uh, estate, were were you able to maintain this after the war? Is it something that you could return to? This uh, estate, right? Yes, uh, Dita's mother lived there, and she saw her in 1948. Uh, Still, she was 90 years old. Saw her the last time she mm -hmm. went first. It was the first one to go to Europe, and. Um, it was un unharmed. unharmed. Yeah. 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 It's uh, 15 acres of meadows and 15 acres of woods and mm. a beautiful old house, much too old to renovate or something, yeah. and a boat's house and so yeah. on, yeah. with a marvelous view towards the lake and the mountains. Like some, somebody, some of my American patients who went there, spent their vacation with me, no? said, how can you live here? It's a vacation country. <laughs> Yeah. So now uh, let's talk something of, of your experience in this country uh, about psychoanalysis in Detroit in this particular area, uh, and really the the course of psychoanalysis in the United States, which uh, has been dramatically uh, influenced by obviously so many European. Uh, trained analysts or European-born analysts uh, coming during uh, those, those war years. Uh, how did you find the, the atmosphere towards analysis in this country? Uh, Freud always had misgivings about uh, uh, yeah. how analysis would be treated by the because he couldn't States. find Wild's trouble, is he? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I must say, I found the, the uh, reception enthusiastic. And it was really very easy to teach and to uh, awaken interest. And particularly in the beginning among uh, psychiatrists, not only, but they were enhanced through the war, mm -hmm. you know. But they saw the value, the immediate value of psychoanalytic knowledge, psychoanalytic dynamic uh, insight into helping people in, in acute situations. Uh, then came a wave of uh, the other. It was analysis was somewhat oversold. You know? mm -hmm. It was considered as a replacement of religion. Religion mm -hmm. is declining, as you know, and uh, people clung to that, and it can't give mm -hmm. them the emotional satisfaction which religion gives uh, in general, because it's a rational mm -hmm. method and mm -hmm. rational uh, theory. And uh, so uh, analysis uh, went through a more difficult time, and goes through a more difficult time now. It, it will recover from this, I'm convinced, because after all, you cannot dismiss something which is uh, the real meat of the whole. After all, psychiatry has been tremendously uh, influenced by it. You cannot open a single psychiatric journal without finding all the Freudian concepts. Mm -hmm. Whether they are for it mm -hmm. or against mm -hmm. it. There they, they are. They use it. Nobody can uh, uh, write a paper without uh, remarking about the unconscious and repression and transference and so on. So the basic concepts are accepted by psychiatry. Um, but it's, it's, uh, there's not so much delineation between psychoanalysis and psychiatry. No. And there shouldn't be. Now, uh your wife, being a lay person, uh, was in a rather unusual position because the the American view of psychoanalysis had, at, at some point, become very fixed as a medical discipline. Yeah. However, there was a uh, rule made by the American Association that whoever was a member of the International before 1938 could become a member of the American Psychi Psychi Psychoanalytic Association. So, uh, yeah. Welder was a member, and all famous yeah. lay people, mm -hmm. and uh, Fritz Redl, and Chris, and uh, all friends of mine, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Eric Erickson, mm -hmm. who was Erickson, Eric Humboldt. Humber. Yeah, yeah. Now, she uh, had no difficulty. No difficulty. And 
she would personally have no difficulties. The uh, I know, of course, uh, and, and agree that that with your position that lay people who have made such amazing contributions and Anna uh, Freud, think Anna right. Freud, and really many other uh, individuals, uh, however, were rather automatically. Uh, denied the opportunity of, of, of training and in a certain sense contribution which I should think uh, was not characteristic of, of Vienna no not at all I think 30% of uh, the uh, members were lay people right. maybe 25% and certainly in England today in this England is, today uh, this, it's the same and I think it will be in America too uh, because uh, psychiatrists uh, have a few strikes against them if they want to become analysts. First, they are medical doctors, mm -hmm. and they are trained against uh, psychological thinking in general. Then uh, they go in the state hospitals for their training, and they learn how to mistreat patients hmm? instead of yeah. treat them. Right. If a, a physician has there, or a psychiatrist, has five, six hundred patients, not they just no. can write the death, yeah. death certificate. Mm -hmm. is Which is really a, 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 an adversity and, in and terms adversity. Of, of psychological And then uh, this uh, uh, medical thinking is against it. Mm -hmm. Oh, Freud said all that in this question of lay analysis right. brilliantly. And I think it still stands. And still the American Psychological Association now is fighting gradually to moving gradually in this that direction. They can't yes. help it, yeah. uh, because yeah. the contributions were so so excellent. To think of Rapport, another friend of mine, hmm? uh, Eckstein. Hmm? Now, uh, also certainly in the field of child analysis. Uh, Particularly, yeah. this has been, I, I think. Uh, yeah, certainly. because uh, uh, child analysis uh, in general is better done by a woman, and the Americans don't permit female doctors. I was so surprised. Thirty-six percent of the medical students when I went to medical s uh, school in Vienna were women. You don't mean it. Yeah, yeah that and is here it's two two percent maximum. Yeah. No. So there were many female, female... Long doctors. before the living, uh, women's oh, liberation yeah, long movement. Uh, and there were excellent doctors. What accounts for this? Why were there oh, so... Oh, I think this uh, um, ideal of the masculine he-man who has to be the powerful yeah. person and so on. And I would let a, a, touch, uh, a woman touch me and examine mm -hmm. me and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. That's a false ideal. But I'm, I'm really... I think liberation does something good in this respect. Yeah, but, but still, that it should have been so uh, far in advance of, of this movement in the United States. It really, really does amaze me that... Uh, I don't know why, why the Americans uh, male is so much against women. Hmm. And the women take revenge for it. You know, yeah. well, they let work them to death, and uh, yeah. he has to get up to f make the formula and wash the dishes and bring the money home. And mm -hmm. dies of a heart attack at 50, you know? yeah. and they they get all the money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know that 80 percent <laughs> of uh, the American uh, uh, fortune is in the hands. Capital of women. is yeah. held in the hands of women. So now, uh, what have been your uh, let us say your your major you you mentioned earlier you're delighted that you came to to Detroit and Gross Point. Uh, obviously there have been travails and ups and downs, uh, but obviously you've also had an opportunity as you left Europe to to settle really pretty much wherever you, wherever you w would want to have moved, and apparently you've had. Uh, no change of uh, of mind in the course of the years. No, uh, no. Uh, I, I wouldn't uh, have settled in Europe. It was too dangerous. I was invited to Holland right away to settle there, you know, uh, when we left Austria. And I looked it over, and when I came back, I was alone there. When I came back, I said to my wife, 
<clears throat> it's much too, too close to Germany. Mm -hmm. We can't do it. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. Jones wanted to send us to South Africa, to Johannesburg. Johannesburg. But fortunately, it didn't go through. You didn't go uh, to Johannesburg, and you've never regretted that. Uh, oh, no. 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 Uh, has your, I don't really know much about Johannesburg. Has it moved? Uh, no, I think it's, it's so reactionary and so sterile. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing. But it would not have been a, a very suitable atmosphere. No, uh, there was a certain uh, person, Wolf, who was a kind of, who l wrote the Black Hamlet. Mm. And, but even he moved away later and mm -hmm. died in New York. Mm -hmm. you know, because it was not a good field. Any Australia other? seems to be somewhat better. Uh, some would have uh, not been, however, high on your list at that point. No. Uh, and so many friends of mine came to. So we had uh, uh, connections right away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, th and this is really perhaps a curious uh, question to ask you, but could you conceive of yourself have having gone into any other field than, than analysis? I think if analysis hadn't existed, I would have become a passable doctor. An internist, An perhaps. internist or something. I see. You, you obviously... But, uh, yeah. uh, my uh, interest is so wide, you know, is not narrowed down, even in analysis, mm -hmm. to be a clinical technician. But uh, you know how many papers I wrote on applied psychoanalysis. Right. Because uh, it would have been too narrow for me, with my interest in music and literature right. and art and so on. So I, I, I never regretted it. I couldn't do anything mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I didn't become a musician. I don't think I was gifted enough. I was hesitating during the First World War. Should I study medicine or should I... Study music. Or should I study music? But I, I knew I wasn't gifted enough to become a great violinist and just to sit in the orchestra and play mm -hmm. is not mm -hmm. satisfactory. The musicians are not... Obviously, this has been... Uh, a very central theme. I don't know how you came by your uh, striving for, uh, I, I think perfection isn't, isn't the correct term, but for a, a distinctive, outstanding uh, contribution involvement, so that obviously what you're saying is to be a, a mediocre a uh, musician would have would have been a, a uh, totally uh, yeah, unsatisfactory, uh, mediocre physician. I didn't know whether I would be an, an outstanding psychoanalyst, but at least I would do something which really would absorb my personality. And that you could devote more yourself than, to completely. Than music, music might have. It still absorbs a mm -hmm. great part of my personality. But uh, you're happy with the distribution. I have an addiction, you know. Uh, somebody lent me a violin, a Guarneri del Gesù, which is one of the great violins. He's uh, the only one besides Stradivarius, you know. And I can play it for a lifetime, for my lifetime. And uh, since then I'm addicted to the violin. <laughs> I, I can think of worse addictions. <laughs> now, uh, Currently, your life is is very much, I would presume, as it, as it has been uh, uh, devoted uh, largely be, to your practice. To, to, largely to my practice, yeah. Uh, horseback riding, I love. I love to do horseback riding. We ride four times a week, even here in Detroit. Oh, you ride here in Detroit oh, yeah, as well? Yeah. Uh, and of course, in Vermont every day. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, you, now you keep a stable in Vermont. Yeah. Uh, and but you don't go there in the winter time. Uh, no, our house is not insulated. You cannot. Yeah, yeah and, and use it quite in inaccessible. It's uh, quite inaccessible. Yeah, it yes. would be difficult yeah. to get there in the winter. But it's isolated and beautiful in summertime. Now, uh, uh, admittedly, this is brief. Uh, 
Is there anything else that, that you would like to cover before we have an opportunity to move around and, and uh, go over some of the things in the room, which... Uh, um. Not that I know of. I uh, regret only that uh, I lost my uh, um, urge to write since so much is written, so much is published. Hmm. I don't want to burden the readers with, with more stuff than they have to read anyway. This is the greatest difficulty which I find nowadays, is this wealth, this flood of publications. Mm. And uh, you cannot read all of them, and it's difficult to make a choice. So one doesn't read as much as one really should, because one always fears it is not worth it. It's only 10% really worth reading. Hmm? And uh, this is maybe a difficulty of having not contact with... Uh, uh, enough with a uh, uh, greater psychoanalytic center where one would tell you, you have to read this paper, you this, yeah. Yeah. this paper, and select it, would uh, select better. But I have enough contact with Niederland and mm -hmm. with uh, these people, with Minister Berger, who is in, my, in, in this research project, and Arlo, and mm -hmm. so on, so that on gets uh, hints what is worth reading. Most of it is not. No. It's rehashing of concepts, juggling with concepts who lost their, their contact with the clinical observation. Mm -hmm. Founded by works of art, and uh, which I worship very much, and uh, uh, I brought to a great, a great deal from, of it from Austria, and acquired some when prices were still possible, you know, at the time. Now, this here, uh, if you, is a little capriccio by Francesco Guardi. He was a contem contemporary of Tiepolo in Venice and uh, uh, died in uh, 1793. And it's a very characteristic picture of, uh, and he was the uh, son-in-law of Tiepolo, or, and anyway, he was uh, related by marriage to Tiepolo. And this is Francesco Tiepolo, a sketch by Francesco Tiepolo, by Giovanni Battista Tiepolo, that's it. Giovanni Battista Tiepolo, a sketch of an old man. This is uh, probably Austrian or Striegel, uh, a southern German painter, around 1420, 30. This is a uh, Rembrandt, a drawing, an original drawing by Rembrandt. Uh, Abraham and Isaac. This is a little French study of a uh, statue of the, from the 15th century, early 15th century. This here is Spanish by Per Valle, a Catalanian uh, painter. And uh, it's ex magnificently preserved because it was hanging in a chapel in Spain where it was covered with soot and wax through the centuries. And this preserved the tempera, 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 tempera colors very well. Now, this here, you should get, uh, get a good picture of this here. This is a receipt by Ma Michelangelo with his own handwriting and uh, for part of the payment and for the Moses statue. Yes. It says, Io Michelagnolo detto Buonarotti. Dito Ludovico e ricevuto oggi questo di 7 di maggio, 1915, 13, he received 200 gold tuckets. And he gives. This is Austrian Baroque. This is very valuable because it's from the Niederrhein and is an 
approximately around 1150. 1150. This is Baroque. And this is an Austrian painter, this over there. I think that's all that I have to show. Now, you were going to show us uh, your... Uh uh, the certificate. Your certificate. Yes. Yeah. Can you show us that in some detail? Yeah. This is his certificate. It says, uh, this confirms that Dr. Richard Sturber in Vienna <coughs> in, uh, has gone through the courses of the Institute from January 25 till July 27. How short that was and the training. <laughs> and uh, uh, is signed by Helene Deutsch as the director of the institute and uh, says for the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society, Professor Freud, uh, president. And there are two of these extant. Yeah, one is Grete Biebrings and mine. And uh, it was uh, uh, stopped then because the other society complained that they didn't have Freud's name on their certificate. On their certificates. So, only, I have it from Freud that I'm an analyst. <laughs> <laughs> uh, know somebody said it is like a Newton would give a physicist. In 200 years it might be very valuable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Imagine uh, if you have the certificate from, from Newton. By the way, this uh, Michelangelo receipt I got from my friend, the publisher, Kurt Wolf, as oh, a birthday present. <laughs> you have magnificent <laughs> friends. Yeah, he was a very, yeah. very nice man. Well, thank you so much for showing us around, for giving You're us your very, time. Very it was a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, just great. All right. <laughs>